And I would like for you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews, the third chapter, and we'll begin reading in just a moment in Hebrews chapter 3 with verse 7. I don't want you to miss the title of the message because I believe in this thought we have encapsulated everything, everything I'm trying to say to you, and this is the Sabbath life. The Sabbath life. Our God has told us so much about the Sabbath. I recommend to you again that you go back and revisit my series of messages I've given long ago, long, long ago. I think they were just on the radio, on our radio broadcast in the country, but on the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> and especially uh, commandment number four. On remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I hope you'll do that. But not a day, but the life, the Sabbath life. And please pardon me for repeating certain things. We find the principle in the Sabbath day and the observance of the Sabbath day. We find in that the principle we need for the Sabbath life, for the life of resting in the Lord Jesus. He has said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why don't we just admit that we've got a world, not just a nation, a world that's unraveling. We live in a culture of broken homes. A culture of broken homes and broken lives. I mean by that, we're not happy at all. There's no delight in saying such a thing, but we recognize that there are more people who have a home that's broken than one that is not broken. Statistical things are almost meaningless. They truly are. They're almost meaningless unless they take place and you're one of those statistics or someone you love is one of those statistics. God has taught me some things through these years and through every trial, I don't say anything terribly difficult has gone on, but through every trial, God is instructing us. He did say, learn of me. Learn of me. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The Apostle Paul said when he penned those words to Philippi, I have learned, I have learned whatever state I'm in, that would to be content. What have we learned? I believe there's a great lesson here for us in this Sabbath life, this life of resting in Jesus. And let's talk a little bit more about it as we continue in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye would hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And 
To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished, from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day saying in David, today after so long a time as it is said, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall at the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and mara and as discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. As you read through this passage in Hebrews, if you begin in chapter 3 with verse 11 and you read through chapter 4 through verse 11, you're going to find 11 times the word rest is given. Once in verse 8, the reference here for if Jesus and that a New Testament reference to Joshua, not the Lord Jesus Christ. But count them for yourself sometime. Rest, rest, 11 times, rest. And right in the heart of this, he says in verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now, while this is fresh on our mind, I want you to hold your place right here. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 2, just for a moment, please. What do we learn from this? The creator God created the world. By him all things consist. But God tells us in chapter 2 and verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them finished finished, the work is finished. And of course this reminds us of what we find in John chapter 19 and verse 30 when the Lord Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. Everything God required for our salvation was finished. The struggle is over. It's finished. We are saved not by works which we have done, we remember that he became sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We remember that for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. There's nothing we can do to add anything to what God has already done to pro provide our salvation. So the Bible says, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he hath made. This seventh day, this day of rest, I've talked many times to you about our resting and our observance of the Lord's day as we refer to this New Testament observance of the Lord's day. Every day, every day is a Lord's day, but one day should be set aside as the Lord's day. And I want you to remember, as long as you're a member of this Temple Baptist Church, that we are out of step and will remain out of step. As we are in step with God, we will be out of step with the world. It's not much of a reproach. Honestly, it isn't. And that reproach is to be identified with the Lord Jesus, but it's not much of a reproach to think that people may think we are foolish. And you must deal with this with your children. What are you teaching your children about the Lord's day? I said years ago when I came as the pastor, so many years ago, if you hold some office in this church, then I will insist as a pastor, though I don't want to tell you what to do and I'm not going to try to run your family, God gave parents to lead families. I want you to know that as a pastor, I'm going to say that I don't want you to hold an office in this church if you allow your children to be participating in organized athletics on some team or something on the Lord's Day. And when I said that, some people were in shock. They were in shock. What have we done with the Lord's Day? Let's, let's turn it inside out. Let's turn it inside out. What's left of the Lord's Day? What is left of the Lord's Day? As the world marches on toward eternity and a Christless one, what barriers are left along the way to remind them of God, to remember as a creator God whom we love and worship? What's left of the Lord's day? And so many churches have become so accommodating of things that they say, well, any, any time, anywhere, any, any place, of course, of course we want people to come to the Lord and, and we have hundreds of our people out and witnessing and Bible studies all week long and outside of our, outside of our church on, on the Lord's day, outside of our church, we have nearly 150 Bible studies going on all through the week and we're glad for that. We want to continue to do more of it. No doubt about that. But is there such a thing as the Lord's day? When John in the Revelation as Christ revealed himself to John, said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What, what did he mean? In the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians, when Paul said that we are to come together on the Lord's day or the first day of the week, worshiping God and bringing our gifts and our offerings, what did he mean by that? Is there such a thing as this biblical expression? Is there reality in this? Is there biblical teaching in this? And I, I submit to you that not only should we observe the Lord's day, Old Testament, we make reference to the Sabbath, but now we know since the resurrection of Jesus, worshiping on the Lord's day, that it's not just reality, it is reality, and God does place this emphasis on it, but there's much more to learn about it. If I brought a child in, a young man or young lady in, and I said, now you've been through something and you've learned from this. This happened once, you did this once, but what have you learned from this one incident for all of life? And I say to you that God has designed the Sabbath, the rest, the recognition, the remembrance, the rejoicing, the reverence for God on this day he has designed this Lord's Day so that not just a Sabbath day would be remembered, recognized, reverenced, hallowed the day, but there are life lessons to be learned not just about a day but about the Sabbath life. It reminds us of exactly what Jesus said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. I say to you, it should not be treated just like any other day. God does not intend for it to be treated like any other day. And serious Christians, and I add that little note, 
serious Christians. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean unhappy Christians. If you think synonymously we think serious Christians are just unhappy people, then somebody's fooled you. Don't be fooled. I'm a happy Christian. I'm happy in the Lord. I have peace in my heart, joy in my soul, a companion. For everything I go through in life, Jesus is with me. Don't, don't, give, don't give the impression that those who are taking their Christian life seriously are miserable. But for serious Christians, preparation is made. Even on a Saturday, preparation is made for the Lord's Day so certain things don't have to be done. Just an example, I may be caught somewhere without gasoline in my car on the Lord's Day, but I want to plan that I don't have to stop and buy gasoline on the Lord's Day. Just, just one example. And there are many things. God does allow for the, the conducting of things of necessity. I've been in the hospital on the Lord's Day. I'm glad there were nurses working. I'm glad there are emergency rooms open. I'm glad there's acts of mercy allowed and freedom to observe and conduct these acts of mercy on the Lord's day. So I, I'm, I'm trying to say something to you, not just about something somebody might call Sabbatarianism, but we just worship the day. We worship the Lord. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, listen to what the Lord said. Again, have this in your mind. If God made a gift of this in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God says, I have made a gift of this to you. It's a gift to you. The Sabbath was made for man. So what do I mean? What am I trying to say? I wrote a little paragraph and I read it earlier, but I'll read it again. And this paragraph you find in your bulletin. Is, is Sabbath a biblical term? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2.27. The Lord Jesus taught that the Sabbath is his gift to us. Sabbath is a way of life. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4 in a moment. It frees us from the bondage of our own efforts. It delivers us from the competitive man-centered life. It is our call to rest in the Lord for the results. Sabbath living is not just a day of rest. It is a life of resting in the Lord Jesus. It allows us to live the Christian life because of what he has done and is doing for us. God says he wants us to understand this. This Sabbath living. It's a serious matter not to observe the Sabbath. Uh, look in the book of Jeremiah just for a moment. And we hear about the destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying away of God's people by the, the Babylonians. At the heart of all this, in the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, and the 27th verse, the Bible says, in Jeremiah 17, 27, but if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear burden even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. This desecration of the Sabbath he says, will bring devouring the palaces of Jerusalem with a fire that shall not be quenched. If we tried to find one thing that was a telltale sign of the crime against God, the neglect of God, forgetting God, in our land, in our day, if we tried to find one thing that revealed the overall general attitude that people had about God, 
it would be what we find in the treatment of the Lord's day. In the total neglect of God by the overwhelming majority of people, overwhelming majority of people on the Lord's day. Now listen, I love you and I want to help you, but I'm not just interested in helping you, I'm interested in helping your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. We gotta get a hold of this. So if you say, that's not for me, that's your business. But I'm just telling you, God intends for certain things to be learned about this Sabbath life, this life of resting in him. Turn with me please to Deuteronomy chapter five just for a moment. Here we have again um, the commandments given to us, but this time just a little differently in Deuteronomy chapter five. And let's begin please with verse 12 in Deuteronomy chapter five. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Now look, I think anybody that's serious about the Sabbath or about the Lord's day is not on Saturday night staying out and running wild as late as possible. They're getting rest for their body and they're in and bed at a decent hour and they've made preparation. As silly as it may sound to this generation, in our, in our time there were church clothes we prepared for our children and this was done on Saturday so that on the Lord's day when we got up we were ready to go and doing these things there was great preparation made because of our recognition of the Lord's day but it was really recognition of worshiping God and giving that day to God let's continue here verse 14 but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it thou shalt not do any work thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. So the people who, who are doing the service can rest as well as you're resting. And I, I repeat to you, I've said so much about this in a message given on the fourth commandment. I hope you'll get it. Let's make sure it's online so people can, can see that and hear it. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commandeth thee to keep the Sabbath day. Now, all of this comes out of keeping the Sabbath day. And when we're not keeping the Sabbath day, we're not recognizing the Lord's day, we're not recognizing the Lord, then the people forgot. The people forgot that God redeemed them. Understand that? Look, please, in verse 15. And remember, that's a word you ought to mark, remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. Do you think those people should have ever forgotten that they were servants in Egypt? Do you think they should ever remember, ever forget those plagues and the mighty deliverance that God brought by the blood? Well, what about those of us who have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus and his finished work on the cross as he bled and died and was buried and rose from the dead? We should never forget him. As he said, it's finished. The debt's been paid in full. Observing the Lord's day is a way of remembering the Lord. Remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out of thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commandeth thee to keep the Sabbath. Now, I appreciate you being patient with me, but turn please to Psalm 37. So what is this Sabbath life? God rested. He's instructed us to rest. It's more than a day of rest. It's a life of resting in him. I've been beside some of you with, I'm sorry, dead babies in your arms. Without God, you could never have made it. And, and look, it's not just that moment 
It's the thought of that moment that reoccurs in life and the peace you find from giving that to God and resting in God. We have some of our most precious people who've been with me all these years. They love their, they love their wives like I love my wife. I look into my wife's eyes and I think of all that's there. You see, we see through our eyes and think in our soul and spirit about the love and devotion that we've shared for all these years. But could you imagine if something happened and you could not think that way? I'm thinking about a precious couple in our, in our church now. And there are many of them, but one in particular I'm thinking about. He looks into the eyes of his wife. He sees the same eyes, the same color, the same beauty, but there's a, there's a stare in those eyes because through those eyes, the mind that she once had to think and love and devote is gone. How does that man deal with that? Only if he can rest in the Lord. Listen, this, this journey is too great for us. God means more for us than just to have a day. Oh, he wants us to have the day. And thank God we need the day. I understand from the French Revolution, as I was reading from the French Revolution, they wanted to change the calendar to a 10-day week. And they soon realized that they were just going to rest once every 10 days. But it didn't work. God didn't design the human life and body and mind for that. He knew, our great designer knew what we needed. And one of the reasons we're unraveling and people are walking into theaters and doing unheard of things, shooting and killing. And I don't, I don't call that insanity. I call it murder, deliberate murder. But what's happened to this country? So much of it can be traced back to a nation that's forgotten God. You know that's true, don't you? What are we going to do to keep that from happening when our children and our generation? We must understand something about the Sabbath life. Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest, rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him that Prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. You say, if I could have a day to give to God and reverence God and worship God and honor God and rest, rest from my labor and rest in the Lord, that'd be wonderful. Oh, we have that. That's what God designed. But... He also designed a life to be lived that way. And this is not the cessation of, of labor or working hard. Look, I believe in working hard. I believe in working hard. Three medical doctors told me recently, you just collapsed and you needed to rest. And I said, I agree with you, I'm sorry. And you were just dragging around. I said, yes, my... I was dragging my legs around trying to get something done and I didn't have the strength to do it and I was trying to make myself do it and just going, going, going until I couldn't go anymore and I finally just collapsed and my body shut down. I understand that. But it's more than physical rest we need. We need that. God designed that. But what about trusting him, believing him? You see, this has invaded churches, Christian homes. I'm talking about things that are supposed to belong to God. We've, we've put our confidence in ourselves and so we, we think if we've got to work hard at it, we've got to make it happen. We have to make it happen. We, we have to do so much to equal so much and we've just taken God out of the picture. 
That's not the way the Lord intended for us to live. What about God's people? He told God, He told His people in Leviticus chapter 25, you let the ground rest every seventh year and there'll be crops of plenty and things that God will bless and you put up this for that and, and this will happen and, uh, and I'll take care of you. Can we still trust Him? What about when the manna was sent from heaven and they said on the Sabbath day, on this certain day, uh, don't, don't try to hoard now. I mean, God knows what he's doing. He'll take care of you. Will he take care of us? <laughs> sure he'll take care of us. Look at the 46th Psalm just for a moment. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early, the heathen rage and the kingdoms of the earth were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolation he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Listen to this. Be still. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God said, be still. He knows how to still us. He can stop your heart from beating. He can stop your body from breathing. He can stop your mind from working. He can say, enough! We run wild. You say, look at the world. Look at the world. Total disregard for God. Look at the world. I, I'm not looking at the world yet. I, I, I'm just saying, look at God's people and the disregard God's people have for the Lord and the desecration of the Lord's day. And what they could learn about God in the Lord's day. We're, we're a people of constant motion and God said, be still. We're people who think that the only way to help anybody is to keep them entertained. And God says, be still and know that I am God. There is a Sabbath life. Oh, may the Lord by his spirit, I, I can't make it, I can't make it clear. I really can't, I'm trying. God has stilled me. I, I've stared at the wall and thought, what next? What am I going to do? Where can I go? Is it more effort I need to make? No, it's faith. Believe in the Lord. Being guided by God. Be still. You know, you may give your children everything. They may have all the money they need. Think they have all the time they need. But the life they live has nothing to do with reverence for God as it ought to be. There's no rest for that. Now, just a moment. Just a moment, that's all. Hebrews chapter 3. Let's say it together, will you? One, two, three. Would you please? One, two, three. Let's say it together. One, two, three. There's a rest in Hebrews chapter 4. There's a rest that is past, a rest that is future, and a rest that is present. Let's get all the way down to verse 9. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. There remaineth. What rest is that? That's the rest of the future. 
That's the third thing I'm talking about. There remaineth a rest. In the margin of your Bible, you might want to write this. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. How many of you believe that you're saved? Heaven's your home. Christ is your Savior. And when you leave this world, there's a rest out there in the future for you. There remaineth a rest. All right? That's yet. But there's a rest that's past. The Bible says in verse 10, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. There's a past rest. The struggle is over. I gave in. I yielded. I said to the Lord, can't save myself. No matter how hard I try, the only way of salvation is in Jesus Christ. Just as God's finished work brought his rest in Genesis chapter 2, just as the Lord Jesus' finished work brought his rest as he, as he died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead, it was completed, it was finished, it was completed. And when you and I ask God to forgive our sin and by faith trust the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we're no longer in enmity with God, we're no longer enemies with God, we're now children of God. And that rest we needed in salvation and forgiveness of sins is settled, that's past. So in the past there's rest, in the future there's gonna be rest. But look please, verse 11, let us labor Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now let's vote. We don't labor to be saved. For by grace you are saved, I said earlier, through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. There's nothing we can do to make us, to labor to be saved. We don't work to get to heaven, do we? We don't work to be saved. We don't work to get to heaven. So what's he talking about? A rest that requires labor. It's a battle. Look, please. It's a daily battle. It's a daily battle. <laughs> I said to you, I said in the emergency room, and I actually took my watch and told, showed the doctor. I said, look, I have to be out of here by a certain time. Can you imagine someone so pompous and egotistical that would say to the doctor, I know you're running this place, this emergency room, and I know everybody's doing the best they can. You've got two very serious people I heard that came in. But I had a meeting to get to. How foolish. Finally, they had enough of me. They had enough of me. And they came in and said, you're not leaving. You're not going home. You're staying with us. You know what I had to do? I had to yield had to surrender. Look, please. I had to say, no more fighting with you. You win, I lose. You're right, I'm wrong. You're in charge, I'm not. Right? Right? You take over. I'm tired, I'm tired of trying to run this hospital. You take over. Right? Now listen to me. That's every day we live. Every day we live. Lord, I'm not going to fight with you anymore. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to try to tell you what to do anymore. I'm going to listen to you. I'm not going to try to fix everything I'll work when you want me to, but I'm going to let you fix everything that only you can fix. I'm going to faith you and believe you and trust you. And guess what happens? Would you like to guess what happens? You find rest. As long as you fight and fight and fight, you'll never find the rest. I want to live the rest of my life 
God helping me, oh, I'll stray, and you will too, in that Sabbath life rest. And we're reminded of that every, every week in the observance of the Lord's day, if it's observed correctly. And I want to learn to live that, not for a day, but for a life. Let's enter in. Look at the verse. Verse 11, Hebrews 4. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. I want to enter into that rest. Now, I'm assured of the rest to come. Heaven's my home. How many of you have that? Would you raise your hand? I'm assured that I've asked God to forgive my sin, and by faith I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. That rest in the past. How many of you know that's settled? Matter of fact, that settled the future rest. But oh, Lord, what I need now is this present rest. Right? <laughs> and it's mine. Oh, praise God, it's mine in the person of Jesus if I just yield to him and say, thy will be done. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Father, thank you for your precious word. Help us now how we need thee. In the name of Jesus, we praise thee for all we have in thee.